Hi everyone, it's me, Carrie. So I'm on a bit of a walk right now, but I wanted to talk about this topic that I've been hearing murmurs about for a couple years. And what is that topic? Well, there's this planet that's orbiting the sun right now up there in outer space. And that planet is named Kerry Huang 10003. Like what, how did this happen? It has the same name as me. Obviously, it's a huge honor to be attached to something happening up there in the astronomical world. So recently, someone asked for an artist's rendition of what this planet might look like. Anyway, nothing here is to scale, but we have Earth, Jupiter, some random dwarf planet like maybe Sedna, and then we have a realistic depiction of 10,003 Kerry Huang. Yeah, that artist was me. And the person who asked for this was also me. But what's going on? The International Astronomical Union is like this multi-country organization that names all the minor planets out there. By the way, this is a minor planet, not like a real big planet like Earth, Jupiter, or Venus. Every time they discover new minor planets, like they give them names. By the way, there's close to a million minor planets humanity has discovered in the solar system. Over a million if you include unnumbered ones, but only 20,000 or so have names. Scott Manley's iconic YouTube video shows this discovery process since 1980. You should check out his channel. And I also realized while editing that Scott Manley also has a planet named after him, so high five Scott planet buddy! And my guess is that someone on that organization was a fan of the scale of the universe, which is a tool I made in 2010 to compare the sizes of objects from humans to galaxies to atoms and so on. When I go to the documentation, like the list of all the planets, it says Kerry Huang, creator of scale of the universe. And so, you know, whoever chose that name, huge thank you, I'd love to meet you. But if you want to know some fun facts about this planet, it's 3.5 kilometers in diameter. So I think it's about like two miles or 2.5 miles which is pretty cool. And then also, it's named 10,003 because it's the 10,003rd minor planet discovered. So Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, is the biggest asteroid or like minor planet. I, I think there's like some blurry line between the definitions of those things. But Ceres was the first one discovered that wasn't one of the main eight planets. So it was named one Ceres. And then there was like three more that were a little smaller. I think they're like Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. I don't remember the order. So this flurry of asteroid discoveries happened in the very early 1800s. And at the time, society just considered them new planets like Saturn. But fun fact, according to James Hilton's article in the Astronomical Applications Department, people in the 1800s went from listing nine major celestial bodies with symbols to almost 30. I assume these were used for star charts and the like. But this raised concern in astronomers like Ben Benjamin Gold, to the point that he called this overabundance of symbols an evil to be remedied. Wow, that's kind of harsh, Ben. I know your name has been appropriated by that dog thing these days, ben. but you don't gotta be so mean. But basically, as the number of celestial bodies grew from the double digits to the triple digits, you can see how it made more sense to give each one a number and put it in a circle, instead of a unique symbol for each one, just for cataloging purposes. And now here's my planet symbol. But they were like, two palace, three Vesta, four Juno. I, that could be wrong, it's in some order, but basically what this tells you is that Kerry Huang, I guess the planet named after me, which is, it sounds like a crazy thing to say, again it's a minor planet, it was the 10,003rd minor planet discovered, and I believe it was discovered in 1971, so it's actually like 50 something years that it's been known, but it hasn't been named until June of 2021, so that was kind of recent. What's crazy is it's a pure coincidence that this planet is 10,003. That's so close to a round number, right? But that's just random chance. And by the way, they, they name these planets after like everything. So some planets are named after like the astronomer's grandchildren, or maybe like named after like the theater where they used to watch movies where they grew up. I know that um, Andrew Wiles, who's a mathematician who solved Fermat's last theorem, he has a planet named after him too. He's like a couple planets before me. I think Andrew Wiles is like 9,996 or something. I, don't, I can't remember exactly, but it's like, I'm 10,003. So like, he got his planet before me. Andrew, you beat me. It's okay, I admit it. Again, like, I, I think that like, how am I deserving of this? All right, so Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has this pretty nifty website called the Small Body Database Lookup, where you can find details about pretty much anything that orbits the sun, such as 10,003 Kerry Huang. 
And here's some interesting stats I found. So little q and big Q are like the closest and furthest distance that it orbits the sun by in AU. So you can see that it orbits about 2 to 2.5 times the distance from Earth, which puts it at the inner edge of the asteroid belt, because you can see it's like 2.5 to 2 AU there. So it's good to know that Carrie Huang has friends in the asteroid belt. But what I also thought was interesting is that Carrie Huang's year is 3.3 Earth years. So it takes 1,201 days for Carrie Huang to orbit the sun. So I can actually calculate my age in Carrie Huang years. So I'm about 26.7 Earth years, but in what would that make me in Carrie Huang years? Probably less than 10 years. I'm only 8.11 years old if we're going by Carrie Huang's standards. And then the day, like the, the rotational period for Carrie Huang is only 3.2 hours. So that means that around like seven or eight Kerry Huang days pass for every Earth day. That means that if this YouTube video is 10 Earth minutes long, if we were to scale from Earth time to Kerry Huang time, that would mean that this video is roughly 75 Kerry Huang minutes long. And that's a lot of extra YouTube content, so you better be grateful. By the way, you might see Sigma. Oh my gosh, that's like a gen alpha word describing like sigma males and all that. But in this case, sigma is actually referring to standard deviation as a measure of uncertainty because we don't know the exact diameter of Kerry Huang. We know that it's 3.4 kilometers, but it could vary by on average 0.09 kilometers. Let's talk about that 3.5 kilometer radius. Remember that animation I played at the beginning? Obviously, it wasn't to scale. But in the interest of not spreading misinformation online, why don't we actually resize the planets so they are to scale? I mean, that is my whole shtick and the reason my name is even on this planet, right? Scaling things correctly? So, Earth's diameter is about 13,000 kilometers, but Jupiter is roughly an order of magnitude larger at 140,000 kilometers. Now, with super eccentric Sedna, we have so little imagery of this nincompoop that nobody knows its diameter that closely. It's in the ballpark of 1,000 kilometers, but different models return slightly different results. And then, oh god, to even see Kerry Huang on the screen right now, you have to, yeah, you have to zoom in a crazy amount. 10,003 Kerry Huang is just 3.5 kilometers across, making it 1 300th the diameter of Sedna and 1 27 millionth the volume slash mass. Also guys, can you tell I've been practicing my blender skills? It would be really cool someday to like go get a really big telescope and point it at the point in space that the planet actually is and just say like I can see Kerry Huang up there but I think it's orbiting between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter it's like around 200 million miles away okay I shouldn't mix metric and imperial it's not going to be visible you have to have a very very good telescope to even see the bigger minor planets like Pallas, Juno, and Vesta and those are like what 200 kilometers across how are you ever going to see something that's like 3.5 kilometers? I don't know. Well, let's see what the data has to say about that. And then it's not very shiny because we have a pretty low albedo, but the absolute magnitude is 14.7, which is really dim. Now remember with magnitude, the larger the number, the dimmer the object. So if we look at this chart, the naked eye can only see about to plus 7 magnitude. If we want to be able to see Kerry Huang at 14.7, we're going to need a roughly 12-inch telescope, which actually is smaller than I was expecting. But this is absolute magnitude, so that means if we're one astronomical unit away. 10,003 Kerry Huang ranges from 0.9 AU to 3.5 AU away from Earth. So it ranges from a magnitude of roughly 14 to 12 times dimmer because of the inverse square law. Fun fact, I wondered, what is the weight of Kerry Huang? Well, assuming a density of 2.71 grams per cubic centimeter, and assuming Kerry Huang is roughly spherical, Kerry Huang weighs roughly 60 billion metric tons. That's crazy because the weight of all living humans right now is about half a billion metric tons. So Kerry Huang outweighs all Homo sapiens by a factor of 120 to 1. Humans, you're losing. But the other cool thing that this website includes is an orbit viewer. So we can see where Kerry Huang is orbiting amongst the stars or amongst the planets. So as you can see, Earth's orbit is in blue. Mars's orbit is in red, and Jupiter's orbit is in orange, and this white orbit is Kerry Huang, which is among the inner edge of the asteroid belt. As you can see, right now, Kerry Huang is pretty far from Earth, and that distance is going to increase as the orbit further, which you can see by clicking play. And then at a certain point, it reaches max distance right about there. But then about, let's see when they reach the nearest approach. Somewhere around here, 
So this will be in 2025, January 2nd. So that's about a year away. Mars, Earth, and Kerry Huang will almost make a syzygy, you know, a straight line, almost with the sun as well. So maybe on New Year's of 2025, you can look up straight up in the sky right at midnight and see Mars and Kerry Huang really close nearby. Oh, and Jupiter's kind of in the same direction as well. But if technology ever improves, I will go find that planet. I will get a photo of it somehow. Um, and maybe if we can get like space travel in like a hundred years. Oh, I don't know if I'll be alive in hundred years. Probably not. Like. If I ever step foot on Kerry Huang, 10,003, like that would be a really cool accomplishment. If space travel ever gets to the point where humans can leave Earth and get to Mars, then I feel like it shouldn't be that much extra fuel to get from Earth to Kerry Huang. Because I know that like 90% of the fuel of launching rockets off of Earth are just getting out of Earth's tiny gravity well. So, you know, making it to Mars might already be 90% of the way to making it out to the outer extremities of the entire universe. And then just to show the whole solar system, we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which is now the furthest most planet. And the further you go, the slower they orbit. Oh, and one other statistic I was gonna talk about is the eccentricity of Kerry Huang's orbit. According to the stats, it's a pretty low eccentricity, only 0.1, which means the orbit is nearly circular. And that makes me feel really good because planets have near circular orbits. Weird asteroids like Sedna or Halley's Comet orbit very elliptically, like they go like shoo, shoo. And I don't know if this is just like asteroid prejudice speaking, but I always thought that the more like eccentric or like elliptical an object's orbit is, the more off kilter and non planet like it was like. So to know that Kerry Huang as a planet has a quite circular orbit. You know, it's kind of a prestige thing. It makes me feel like this is a more of a legitimate planet. It just looks prettier. Basically, life is just a lot more predictable. You're not gonna get crazy fast seasons and crazy slow seasons. Okay, one last experiment for this data set. Do you see how for the descriptions of who this planet was named for, a lot of the times they put the person's name and then born with their birth year, so 1997? For other people, it might be that Igor was born in 1927, or that Nikolaj was born in 1923, or someone from centuries ago, Nishiyama, was born in 1738. Well, I decided to write some code to go through all of these files from the 1000s all the way up to the 600,000s and just scrape all of these descriptions and tally up all the birth years, whether that be 1538 or 1940. Here's the output, which surprised me. If you scroll far enough back in the timeline, you can find some pretty notable examples, such as Fermat from Fermat's Last Theorem, born in 1601, although that is debated, Mersenne of Mersenne prime numbers, we also have Leibniz of Calculus, Bernoulli from the family that did a lot of physics stuff. We also have Euler from 1707 from a billion math things. Voltaire, the Enlightenment writer. Bach, the Baroque composer as everyone knows, as well as Vivaldi, composer of the Four Seasons, and many, many more people. First, to be expected, there's a surge at the baby boomers, born 1946 to 64, since they were at the height of their careers when most minor planets were discovered. This is true even for fields outside astronomy, like Chuck Lorre, an American TV writer born in 1952. But the boomer bulge is rivaled by a nearly as tall spike for the millennials, born in the late 80s and 90s, while Gen X is just forgotten in this trough. I'm not sure what caused this millennial spike, but I want to say it's because astronomers born in the 50s love naming planets after their children born in the 90s, but I have no way of really verifying that this is the main cause. And looking through the data manually, I have to say, I can't really find evidence proving this theory. What I did discover after making this graph is that a lot of middle and high school students won the Intel Science Talent Search and Broadcam Masters Math and Science competition, and as a reward, they got planets named after them in the early 2010s, and since these are teenagers we're talking about, it makes sense that they were born in the 90s. So maybe academic prizes like that are responsible for the spike. Anyway, I am still so grateful that I get to be one of the 152 people born in 1997 with a planet named after them. But the peak year was 1958 with 188 people, followed by 1998 in second with 182 people. The deepest depth of the Gen X Valley is here in 1982 with just 49 people. Now you core and late Gen Zers though, you guys are struggling. You have no academic competitions to boost your numbers, and as a result, this graph quickly falls to the teens by 2004. I believe in you guys though. I just know you've got the prowess to boost those numbers in the decades to come. Thank you for watching this Carrie KH video and goodbye.